In the beginning, you see me doing this lasso tool trick. And this is something that I learned from Dylan Cole's matte painting tutorials. And if it's good enough for the matte painter of Lord of the Rings movies, it's good enough for me. So I have used this ever since I learned it years ago from him. And the beauty of using the lasso tool is when you're using it freehand, you automatically generate all these rough irregular lines. We're gonna get into that in a little bit, but this is the most difficult part to get right about mountains. So the lasso tool helps tremendously in that regard. Also remember that you can use the plus and minus signs to add or subtract from the selection. And when the mountain shape is done, I just fill it with color and start painting that. And the snow I add on a separate layer so that I can edit it later to reflect the shapes of the mountain. When it comes to the lighting of the mountain, I try to block it in my head into bigger chunks and then light those parts first so that it has this logic where the shadows fall. And there is a shadow side to the mountain, but I always try to find light also in the shadows because the sky should be reflected there too. That generates light even to the shadow side. And it's a different type of light and these hue differences are very, very small. And this is the hardest part about painting landscape as a whole because you have an urge to go into extreme ends of saturation and hue, where in fact, if you're painting things that are in a distance, just a small variation in hue or saturation already looks like a big difference. So for example, these trees that are at the base of the mountain, these sort of like bluish green dots, they're almost the same color as the mountain itself. It's just that the light and the hue in that distance makes them look very different. Also that's the reason why these foreground trees look so saturated, even though none of the colors go above 50% saturation. It's just the relative nature of the color that makes them look so saturated. One more thing, and this is kind of like hard to explain when process videos go by so quickly, is that have enough time to just look at your painting. Um, right now I'm having my morning coffee. Often these speed paintings can make it seem like I paint things in a matter of minutes. And it's usually days that it takes me to create these videos simply because it takes time for me to paint these paintings too. And in that time frame, whenever I'm not painting, I try to take enough time to like just do this basically. Here's my painting and then I'm looking at it and then I'm just thinking in my head what I could do to improve it. And I have these visual problems like for example right now, I'm trying to figure out how to solve the tree foreground and maybe add some more visual interest to it. So that's what I'm just thinking and I have several ideas what I could do to it, but I can't be sure. So for that reason I need to paint. But if you go into kind of like blind painting mode, that can kind of make you do work that isn't really worth it. And one more thing about these videos is that it's incredibly hard to film here because this is Finland and as you can see, we don't have sun for the entire winter. So it's gonna be a few more months before we have like days. <laughs> so I am kind of have been filming all of these videos from basically from the night. And the light that you see here is like just all of my lights blasting into my face because with this camera, I need tremendous amount of light so that I don't get super noisy footage. So that's all I wanted to say. Back to the painting and I hope I can solve these trees. After staring at the trees for some time, I noticed that there is one way to solve this visual problem. I should say that there are multiple ways to solve this visual problem because there are always several ways. If you never paint yourself into a corner, you can always change the foreground, you can change the background, you can change the color in both or the shape language in both or 
add other elements that solve those visual problems for you. Whenever you feel stuck, I always remind myself that there are endless ways that this problem can be solved, not just one. The solution for this is that I group the shapes into round shapes and spiky shapes so that it's easier for the eye to process the information in the foreground and then I have easier time painting the foreground because I always know I'm painting a round shape or I'm painting a spiky shape. And the thing that I keep an eye on with this is that distances between the trees should be irregular so that they aren't repeating at the same intervals. And this sort of chaos is the hardest part when it comes to that mountain shape as well. That's why the lasso tool is so handy, because when art students paint mountains, they don't mean to do it, and I don't mean to do it either, but we all, including you, the person listening to this, we subconsciously make regular shapes, because our brain has a really hard time handling this sort of chaos. The chaos looks beautiful, but our subconscious mind wants to make things into specific order. And that's something that you have to keep in mind whenever you're painting nature, that you have to go through it with a checklist and then see if the shapes are repeating, are the sizes of objects the same, because in nature they are not, they are all just chaos and that is really hard to capture. That's why this lasso tool works as a kind of like a brain hack, because it's too hard to control, there is no smoothing on the lasso tool and that's why I use it so many times. I just like the results. I don't know if you agree, but once I started using it, it has been like in my tool set ever since. And when it comes to selection tools, I just want to note that I have changed the opacity of the selection area from Procreate Preferences because that lets me see what my selection whole shape is when it's done and then I can add or subtract from it. So I recommend changing that because I find that the default setting is quite transparent for me to make sense of, so that's just a small tip that helps. Painting this sort of like mists in the mountain, as I'm sure if you have seen my other videos, that is my favorite thing in the whole world. And I know that I love it, so that's the reason why I leave that part to the last part of the painting, because that motivates me to get through the hard parts if I know that there is something fun at the end that I can do. So I always try to leave the kind of like the fun parts that are usually easy for me, that I know that I won't have any trouble with to the last. And here I wanna point out that I am copying the entire mountain as a second layer behind the mountain itself and I'm lowering the opacity to give the illusion that the mountain is kind of receding in depth. When painting objects behind a mountain you have to remind yourself that where the eye level is, if your viewer of the painting, the person that is looking at the scenery in this scene, is on the ground, you probably won't see that many objects behind a mountain. But if you're standing somewhere high above, like for, for example on top of another mountain or on a building, then you will see more objects behind it. So those things affect the way that the scale of the mountain is perceived. If you're thinking of making a palette for landscape painting, I have made this video on how you can do that and what my process for making this sort of palettes is. But if you're making a palette for this type of a painting of a mountain that has snow on top, I want to remind you to be careful of color picking the snow, because in a lot of the landscape photography, the photographers have increased contrast or the camera can't handle the contrast level of the snow with black rock. So the snow shouldn't be white. There should be some sort of like color death and something that you can paint on. So don't color pick white from a photograph because that doesn't give you any editing room later when you are almost done with the painting. When I was thinking of what kind of landscape this should be, I had strong memories of my trip with my boyfriend to Mammoth Valley the look of those mountains around there, because they're very old mountains and they have high level of erosion, so that 
the slopes leading up to the rocky parts of the mountain are very soft and almost horizontal. The way that light hits those mountains changes the color of the rock in a very beautiful way. So I wanted to capture that as part of this mountain, even though it's not a specific mountain in that area. I really wanted to visit Yosemite Valley, but when we were there, it was on fire. The whole valley was on fire, so we didn't get to visit that area, but the surrounding area. And the reason why I wanted to visit Yosemite is because I'm a huge fan of Albert Bierenstad and his paintings are something that have inspired me for a long time. So this is my way of seeing that type of landscape painting and I'm pretty happy with the results. I think whenever you get to that part in a painting where it stops being a picture and you are suddenly in the scenery, it's the cheapest way to travel. It's always magical feeling when you get to that place that you have just like created this entire environment out of thin air. I just love to look at it when it's done. I'm Mikko and I hope this has inspired you to do some cool landscape paintings. I'm looking forward to seeing them on social media. Uh, all of my Instagram and Twitter handles are below and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!